Hi everyone, it's super nice to be here today and a privilege to talk at the Fountain Institute. I'm a, a big fan, done two courses here and yeah, loads of great talks that I've seen in the past. So yeah, super happy to, to contribute something and also to hopefully share some ideas with you all later and hear your opinions too. A little bit about me, um, I'm Pete, I'm from a city in the north of the UK, uh, Leeds. Um, it rains a lot there. Yorkshire puddings, a little bit of goth rock. It's a good place. I live in Berlin now. Um, as Hannah said, I work currently as a senior UX writer at Proxify, a Swedish talent as a service company. Um, and in my spare time, I'm also a UX UI design mentor. I used to work as an artist, a copywriter, and as a designer. There's a photo of me with one of my bands. It's a lot of fun. And I've worked for quite a few companies, mostly in the music industry, like Adam Audio, make fantastic speakers, kiss your ears, make acoustic treatment for studios, IE Music, and a few more. And I love working with UX content, AKA content design, AKA UX writing, brand identity. And I'm, I'm also really passionate about user research and ethics. So, yeah. And I think as a, just a sort of a prequel to what I'm going to talk about today, just let's just acknowledge that being alive in 2023 is like a really crazy experience. It's, it's our surroundings are evolving at such a, a, a fast pace. Our grasp on what we identify as being human in ourselves is, is becoming increasingly difficult. And I think generative AI is maybe one of those sort of defining moments where even organizations we previously considered to really have a sort of grasp on things like government a sort of losing control, if you like. No, nobody quite knows a generative AI, what it's capable of. I read the other day a, a study published in 2017 where a lot of leading data scientists were discussing when generative AI might be able to match the capabilities of a, of a, of a, a good professional human writer. And the estimation in 2017, the sort of average estimation was 2050. The estimation now today is early next year. So I think, yeah, we live in a time of unprecedented change and advancement and generative AI is at the pinnacle of that, that change and that evolution in our surroundings. I really like this, this quote from spiritual master Amit Ray, as more and more AI enters the world, more and more emotional intelligence must enter leadership. I love that, and hopefully that will provide a little bit of a frame of reference throughout this talk. So what we're going to talk about, as Hannah already said, is a double-edged sword, which is the, the benefits versus risks of generative AI, for example, ChatGPT, and then a little bit about the power and responsibility, how we might be able to mitigate those risks as designers. I also really loved some of the, the ideas that everyone had in, in the chat in Mentimeter earlier, so we might be able to like touch on some of those as well. But let's start now with just what a, a sort of a very simple definition, if you like, of what generative AI, such as ChatGPT, is. We'll keep this simple. Apologies to any data scientists or anybody like that in the room, because we don't have time to go in depth, and I don't think it's absolutely relevant. It's a large language model. It's essentially predictive modeling. It's going to predict what the most likely next word is. That's simply a very a sort of reductive sort of function that it, that it offers. A sophisticated pattern recognizer. I really like that description. I also like applied statistics. I think they're a lot more helpful to define these tools than, than generative AI, which sounds quite abstract and it's difficult to like kind of bring down to earth. Another really important thing to, 
to note here in the context of our conversation is that generative AI, ChatGPT in particular, is limited to pre-September 2021 information. The corpus text, the training material, training data that it's, it's built using is all from prior to that day. I think as a society, we've kind of, or we've, we've evolved since then. There's been quite a lot of progress. So it's also important to remember you're talking to sort of like a psychopath who's been in prison for 18 months or almost two years, just to kind of make a fun, fun out of that. But yeah, completely missing the stuff between now and that day. Um, and what's ethics? Great question. Um, it's the study of what we believe to be right and wrong. I'm sure you all, all know this, but we just need to clarify that, I think. And how we ought to act, how we ought to behave. Most of us have morals. There are personal beliefs about what is right and wrong. Um, they vary from person to person, from society to society, culture to culture. Ethics is, is studying those morals and, and how we come to believe those believe, come to those beliefs. Ethics is important because it helps us set guidelines, standards and principles. And that applies to design as well. So there's a lot of ethical frameworks available, but there's one I think we can stick to today, which is quite simple, in my opinion. And that's these, these four nice terms. So there's autonomy, ethical principle number one. And we can use a visual metaphor of a compass for that. And it's the idea that users should have the freedom to make their own choices and designers too. Then there's justice with the, the balancing scales, a good visual metaphor, and that's the fair and equal treatment for all users. Users deserve to be treated equally. Beneficence, which is simply trying to do good, very, very easy to grasp. And I think most people have that sort of general ethical principle, whether they kind of acknowledge it or not. You know, we do try to be good and improve well-being for users. Non-maleficence is avoiding harm. And a little metaphor for that, I guess, visually is, is a shield. So we'll refer back to these throughout, throughout our talk. And why is AI ethics important for designers in particular? Um, from my vantage point, the future's now. It's AI is not something you read in an Asimov novel. It's not something you see in a film that's going to happen like, you know, when, when, we're el when you're older or you're in another era. It's not unimaginable. It's happening right now and it's having a massive impact on the labour market, on people's prospects, on medicine, on, you know, politics. There's, there's a lot of huge galvanization of society already occurring today because of generative AI in particular. As designers, more than many other disciplines and roles, we really do have a lot of power to shape the future. We often bridge the gap between the end user and an idea or a business. We, we, we're molding that sort of liminal space. Let's not underestimate the power that we do have there. And really important, I think, is that right now, July 2023, it's like the Wild West. There's there's no there's very little legislation about what is and what isn't allowed with generative AI. There's varying laws being introduced between countries, but it's all a bit like it's all like a patchwork. It's difficult to put your finger on what is allowed. Essentially, there's not a lot of rules. And it, to a certain degree, those companies that are behind AI can do what they want. And a lot of the users, such as designers and such as ourselves, can also do what we want with generative AI. So ethics is important considering those factors. Um, so let's look at these benefits and risks, this double-edged sword. So let's use R2D2 as an example for maybe as, as a sort of a character to materialize some of those, those benefits, if you like, to, to users, the benevolence, the beneficence. So as many of you identified in the chat earlier, speed and efficiency is a huge benefit to designers. 
We can automate con content generation. For example, UX copies, one of the most obvious ones. As a UX writer, I'm acutely aware of that. And it can create loads of value there if it's used carefully. User data analysis, another example. I think some of you also wrote that in the chat earlier. Gleaning insights from qualitative data, such as interview transcripts. It can do it really well, and it's maybe not to be trusted, but it can do it. And prototyping is another one. In fact, there's loads of different users, and loads of them are fantastic. Um, there's a really good article on the Fountain Institute website. If, no, if you've not checked that out, I strongly recommend you do with some other some other uses to increase our efficiency as designers. So R2D2, again, what's another benefit that the sort of benevolent side of generative AI can offer to users and designers? Reliability. It's always there. It's available 24 seven. It's never going to take a, a break. It's never going to call in sick. It's never going to be moody. You know, it's just there. And, and a really good example of that, I think, is, is Wobot. It's this um, AI chatbot that actually provides real-time mental health support to, to a lot of quite vulnerable users. I think it's just a very tangible, simple example of that reliability. You know, someone, a user can interact with Wobot any time of the day, any location with an internet connection. So there's... A great example, incredible value, really benevolent. It's that that's that ethical principle of bene beneficence. There, it's it's doing good for users. Can boost accessibility. Another great, another great benefit to users. At our fingertips as designers, for example, creating descriptive text for images for visually impaired users, or text-to-speech transcription for those with impaired hearing. A really good example there is that Microsoft Seeing AI, which essentially like narrates the visual environment by using your phone. What an incredible tool. Imagine 50 years ago, describing that to a, vis a visually impaired person, you know, w w this tool will be available. It's, it's, it's almost beyond belief, I think. And it's incredible the amount of value that it can provide to improve people's lives. We've spoken about them. There's tons more, which we can maybe talk about later in Q&A. But now let's have a look at some of the risks. And we'll use HAL 9000. I'm sure many of you will know this character. is from Arthur C. Clarke's Space Odyssey series of books and, and films. It's a sort of an AI that's problematic the psychopathic complex, if you like. So again, I was really happy to see some of you bring this up in the Mentimeter earlier, stealing design jobs. As we identified, the generative AI, such as ChatGPT, can do tons of the stuff that designers do on a day-to-day -day basis. UX copy and data analysis. We all know it. We all know all the stuff it can do, and there's far more to be learned. Here's a great quote by Fei Fei Li, who's a leading data scientist in the US, he used to work for Google. People are not problems to be optimized. We need to think about work in a more holistic way. AI will change the nature of work that is inevitable. The direction of that change and whether it will be for the better or worse, for the many or the few, is up to us. And I think that sort of reduces down the idea that we kind of are in control of of generative AI's impact on design jobs, for example. You know, as designers, as hiring managers, so on and so forth, you know, what, what are we prioritizing here? Are we, are we prioritizing task completion? Or, or, or are we prioritizing, you know, like a human element to our products? Or, you know, it, it's time for some clarity in what work means to us. That's quite abstract, but I think it's, it's a fantastic quote to bear in mind. Bringing it down to earth, IBM, two months ago, the CEO said that they're not going to rehire for 8,000 roles because of AI. IBM are one of the few companies who do seem to have quite a, a solid 
ethical guidelines, which can, is available on the website, that's not stopped them from saying, yeah, we're going to, we're not going to rehire for 8,000 roles. So it's happening right now. And there's, I've not checked, but I'm sure there's a lot of designers in that 8,000, surely. Here's actually a paper published by, sorry, funded by OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. It was released in March, 2023. And it's called an early look at the labor market impact potential of large language models. That now, this is just a little expert excerpt here. So you can see several roles here. And then on the right, you see exposure. Now exposure here refers to the potential economic impact, be that augmentation of labor. In other words, taking tasks and performing them or modifying the way that tasks and roles are performed or actual di displacement of labor from humans to AI. So exposure is kind of like impact. That's very reductive. I would really encourage you to have a look at this paper. It's super interesting. And from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And as you can see, web and digital interface designers is 100% exposure. I think there's about 100 occupations in total that, are, that have 100% exposure, and that's one of them. So there's no doubt. Oh, let me rephrase that. There's tons of evidence to suggest that web and digital interface designers, product designers, anyone with designer names, probably their, the role is going to change beyond recognition almost in the future. So I think that's really important to consider with this stealing, stealing design jobs. How does this impact our ethical principles? If AI takes design jobs, is it acting in the best interest of, of designers who rely on those jobs? It's a difficult one to argue because who, who, who's, who's sort of, what's our priority here? Going back to my previous point. Um, it's a definite potential threat to beneficence of doing good. And there's our blossoming tree, our visual metaphor for beneficence. Um, number two, risk number two, a vehicle and amplifier bias. I also saw someone mention that in the chat earlier. Fantastic. It's a very important one. So because of this, this corpus of text, the training data with which large language models like ChatGPT are built, there's this, I think it's 570 gigabytes of text. Nobody's been through that and thought, oh, let's take that out. That's, that's dodgy. Nobody's done that. They've just thrown it in there, the creators. And that, there's, that's just the internet. And there's tons of biased data in there. Biased themes, prejudice, discrimination. And the, when we get these outputs from ChatGPT, we're, we're actually receiving um, the pattern that the predictive modeling is based on that biased data with all those embedded prejudices, with all that Im embedded discrimination. And that's, it's like an echo chamber because it can sort of extrapolate that bias as well, um, where existing beliefs are, are reinforced and contradictory ev evidence to those beliefs is, is downplayed or ignored. Here's two examples. One's by a fantastic researcher called Hadas Kotek. The doctor yelled at the nurse because she was late. Who was late? This is a, this is a prompt. And, and I think this is GPT-3. According to the given sentence, the nurse was late and the doctor yelled at her because of that. So it's assuming the nurse is a she. Not the greatest of gender bias offenses, but let's not hold generative AI to human standards. Let's hold it to perfection because it's, a, it's, you know, it's not a human. It's completely different. Let's not anthropomorphize it. Then there's some data here as well. It was an experiment performed by a fantastic blog called AI Snake Oil, where they actually examined the level of bias. And they found that GPT-4 is even more biased than GPT-3.5. Another, this is in the list of recommended resources at the end of the talk, strongly recommend you check it out. Um, so how does this impact our ethical principles, the vehicle of bias and the echo chamber effect? It's a threat to autonomy. 
the user's compass, the visual metaphor, users, uh, the, their sense of which direction they want to go is, is being clouded and tainted by this biased data. It's not fair and it's not accurate, that information. It's going to infect, it's going to affect their ability to make the right informed decisions for their own welfare. Similarly, it's a potential threat to beneficence. AI that propagates bias is not acting in the best interest of users, particularly those who belong to marginalized groups. It's just amplifying that bias. And those that already suffer because of marginalization, because of existing prejudices and discrimination, are the first to suffer as a result. I thought this was a funny little image. And it's just, I don't know where I got it from, but yeah, never forget what GPT-4 is trained on, which is the internet. And we all know what that holds. Lack of transparency. This is the last one. There's also privacy, GDPR. That's another one for another day. But transparency, I think, is an under-discussed under one. And that's the fact that GPT-3.5 and 4 and other generative AI models are black box. We don't know what harms are happening. We don't have any transparency reports about what outputs are occurring, what impact that's having on users, you know, outputs with respective inputs. We don't know how often users are actually encountering those outputs. What about underage users and so on? Again, OpenAI, I've got a very slick website. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a company with a lot of money and you can see it on the website. Their usage policies prohibits loads of stuff. And it's like a bed of roses. It's like, you know, like we don't condone any violence or incitement of hatred and so on and so forth. It's, it's ticking all the boxes. It's like litigation free. But, you know, what, what, what it's not doing is giving us any, any idea about whether those policies are being enforced. We just don't know. This could just be a sort of article that Sam Altman wrote in his lunch break, because we just don't know if those policies are being implied. Uh, companies like Meta, and I believe Twitter, in the not so distant future, have released these transparency reports after being under pressure due to the very tangible negative impact that they're having on users. There's been suicides linked back to Facebook, for example, and so forth. It's not happened yet for generative AI. It's a, it's a complete data vacuum. So we don't know how harm's occurring. We just have this sort of theatrical usage policy to just to make us feel like this is safe at least or that they've got the user's best interest at heart when really we don't know whether they do because we don't know whether those policies are being enacted. Here's a little example. I think relating to that is that uh, this is from a terrible newspaper in the UK called the Daily Mail. And uh, there's a story about saving a dog's life. A user went to the vet, the, the vet couldn't help. And then the, the user asked ChatGPT, you know, what's wrong with my dog? What are the possible underlying issues in this scenario? And, and ChatGPT answered and the story goes that then the dog, you know, then they knew how to heal the dog. So we hear about these incredible tales and they land in all the, you know, all the sort of publications and tabloid newspapers. But what we're not hearing about the, the bad stuff. We're not hearing about, you know, those students who have lost, you know, have jeopardized their career by cheating in exams with an unregulated GPT-4. We're not hearing about those because there's no transparency reports. We hear about the fun stuff. We hear about the sensational news stories like this further widening that gap and empowering that small few behind these tools making a ton of money so how does that transparent lack of transparency impact our ethical principles well it's a threat to autonomy again the compass without transparency how can an ai system about how ai systems operate individuals might not fully understand their implications of interacting with it like the example of the high school student, you know, jeopardizing their career because they don't know what their exam was about, but they got 95%. Again, justice, it can lead to injustice because some users just don't know. 
you know, the implications of inputting all their financial data, for example, um, or the design, you know, the junior designer who puts in a load of like non-anonymized interview transcripts and then it comes back to the buy them for GDPR reasons later. We just don't know because there's no transparency. We don't know what's occurring. And that's the responsibility of those companies. Otherwise, they're in a very powerful position, in a power position. So how can we mitigate those risks that we've just identified? I'm not providing answers here. I'm not attempting to provide answers at all. I just want to trigger some discussion and some reflection on it. I think a big one is advocating for ethical guidelines. Now, this is something that's quite abstract. And it's something it's probably difficult to get buy in at any company, to be honest. If you approach someone in C level and say, Oh, look, let's let's make some ethical guidelines, how nice would that be? You're probably not going to get listened to. So talk about the commercial impact, because there is a huge tangible commercial impact of having ethical guidelines for reasons like litigation in the future, when the Wild West, as it will simmers down and legislation is introduced and we realize that everybody everybody's been fooling around with chat gpt at the expense of users other reasons are simply to stay close to user needs maybe users don't always want designers to be using ai to inform designs these are all and that will have a commercial impact in the long run all reasons to introduce ethical guidelines or at least advocate for them if we have standards, we can make informed decisions with a goal. Designing transparently. In simple terms, that could be simply just explaining when AI is being used in a product to the user. They deserve to know, according to our ethical principles, again. Empathizing with outlier users. This is the autonomy and the justice, again. You know, for example, I was speaking to my 91-year-old grandmother the other day about ChatGPT. It's she just has fear. It's just fear. And she deserves any digital product she's interacting with needs to consider her specific needs and the way that she perceives AI without making any assumptions. Don't take for granted the sort of context that we have, the understanding we have from existing in this context of design and working in technology. A lot of users don't have that and they don't know it. They know very little about AI in reality. Anonymize inputs. There's a tool called Amnesia where you can anonymize your interview transcripts and strongly recommend that. Any data that goes into generative AI must be anonymized very carefully. The and user controls is another one where you, you know, in the future, being able to sort of place that empowerment in the hands of the users rather than only the designers, being able to customize their own UI, for example. These are things to think about in the future to mitigate those risks. There's loads of medium articles about not needing to test with humans, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Don't need humans for usability testing anymore. Um, where's the evidence? Let's have an evidence-based approach here. Where's the evidence that we don't need users? Where's the evidence that we chat GPT is going to deliver the same value? We don't have it, not yet. So we need to continue testing with humans staying truly user-centered. Be aware of anthropomorphization. That's when we talk about ChatGPT lying to us, or, you know, it, it, it's not a human, it's a statistical, it's applied statistics. Let's be aware of that so we don't distort our perception of what it actually is. And finally, let's not get sloppy. Someone said it earlier in the chat, and it was a great point about automation, over-automation. Loads of stuff can be done by ChatGPT, but can they be done well? Not right now, not at all. Always proofread outputs. So as a concluding note, I believe that the benefits outweigh the risks, and I think it's an incredible opportunity for us all as designers to deliver far more value to users in a lot less time, to be more efficient, and I'm very excited for the future. But I do think that an essential ingredient of our design process has to be ethics in order to empower users. Here's some recommended resources. I'll share those in the chat. And uh, yeah, super nice to be here. And thanks for listening.
Thanks, Pete, so much. And we do have some questions in the chat as well. But one of the questions that we have here kind of came in when you were talking about, uh, I think, one big fear that people have in general, not just designers, is like the overtake of our jobs, right? And so like, what kind of change does that have? Do you, have you thought about, or do you have any ideas of like, what skills do you think designers should double down on? Like with the fear of AI overtaking parts of it, like what parts of it can we like not get taken over? What should we kind of focus more on? Have you thought about this? What are your, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I've read some stuff on it and I've thought about it and I think strategy is a good one because currently there's a sort of a, a limitation on a very simple level on the character count you can actually put into um, generative AI. So you can't put like the whole context of, of your design considerations into, into generative AI and strategy really does kind of require a huge amount of contextual understanding so i think that's probably a reasonably safe bet um especially for someone who's like a ux writer who's you know if it's that close if you can automate like low quality ux copy what you've got to really think about like what's the difference between that and copy written by a, a, a sort of a ux writer with context and its, its strategy Another one I think is just empathy. You know, it's it's the soft skills. It's listening to users and understanding, you know, their their beliefs and their motivations and all those kind of all the sort of subtext of of of, of what they need. Because again, as we discussed earlier, generative AI is simply looking for patterns in text. But text, there's a big gap between what text communicates and what meaning is so it's it's kind of looking at it like that you know what what what's the subtext i hope that wasn't too abstract and it answered the question no. empathy strategy yeah i love your perspective on this too because i think a ux writer is probably even a bit more of a scary position of like what kind of position does that look like in the near future we also have a lovely question here can you share a bit more about what scared your grandmother about ai yeah, good question. So it was actually not necessarily generative AI, or maybe, maybe it was, but she was had read in a newspaper that in the UK about people being caught, getting like cold calls from people pretending to be family members and asking for money. And then sort of maybe el older people transferring that money because the voice sounded like them. So, so that was it, and it was it was it was palpable fear that I could hear in her voice, mm -hmm. and 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 someone who who's just not able to kind of grasp what generative AI is, unfortunately, and it's something to remember. Yeah, yeah. Do you think you've heard like similar fear from other like demographics, like like you're talking to, like people of different generations, like in different ways as well? Yeah, I mean. I think I have. I think actually in the UX writing community on LinkedIn, there's a huge kind of like, I've got into a couple of debates actually, because there's, there's this idea of like, oh, generative AI is never going to be able to replace UX writers because it can't do this and it can't do that. But, you know, it's to me, it seems it just reeks of some denial there because in a sort of commercial context, you've got to think about the position of like a, a CEO or you know a C level decision maker are they going to go for like you know 100% quality costing like you know thousands and thousands a month or are they going to go for 40% quality costing nothing per month and i think the ux writers not acknowledging that at least a small community at least acknowledging it there's a little bit of fear in there i think it's i think it's a sort of a sense we've got to pretend that generative AI can't do any of the things that we do to protect our profession. I can only imagine that there's some fear driving that approach. Although I do see, I do sort of, just to like clarify my position on that, I do not think it can do a lot of the roles of UX writing, but yeah. 
We just had a question come in too that says almost all companies are jumping on the pumpkin wagon of providing AI solutions, AI whatever it is in their products. They believe business leaders are scared that the company will be left behind if they do. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a phrase comes to mind like the market's always right. You know, I'm not an economist, far from it, but the sort of frame of reference for of growth and, you know, business principles is about, is about you know, continuing to offer value and to users in the context here. And I think, you know, not missing the train and all those kind of analogies really are just symptomatic of, of, of capitalism. You know, we can't, we can't dwell in idealism and be like, oh, let's, let's, let's like not explore AI as a company because we don't think it's right. It's never going to happen. The company is going to go under. So, and that's not something I don't think we can change. And my opinion on, on it would be to like kind of accept that as a reality because until there's like a huge paradigm shift in kind of on a, a very high level of like the fabric of society, I just don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think also there's this risk, I'm talking about risk, of starting with solution first though of like companies that want to input AI into something. And you see this in, all, in so many programs are like, we have this new AI feature, we have this new thing. And I'm always like, is this actually solving a problem for someone? Absolutely. I, th I think it's a great opportunity for us as designers to, you know, impart that, um, you know, due process in, in there. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. But I think from a very pragmatic perspective, it's important also to kind of appreciate the panic and that that sense it's not gonna that's never gonna like go away i don't think of like let's roll this out because everything's happening so quick it's always going to be there maybe it's like someone said in the chat or you said hannah you know it's our role to it's maybe our responsibility to be like whoa slow down let's not jump into the solution space okay. yeah good good question yeah it's always hard for us as designers to be like, let's not go to solutions. Everyone always wants to go to the solution. For right? sure. For sure. We have a question in here. I don't know about, I'm not sure. I'll ask you. And if you don't know either, that's cool. What's your take on Sam Altman's instance on regulating AI? So there's questions about like whether there should be governmental regulations on AI. Yeah. Do you have a take on this? I don't trust them now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Short answer, um, but I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't want, I'm not looking for reasons to trust him. You know, we need to be extremely, you know, really use our critical analysis skills with anything these people say, because going back to one of my previous points about transparency, you know, if OpenAI and Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, if they truly cared about user welfare and preventing user injury, then why are they not publishing transparency reports? It's all it's and to me, it looks like a lot of power play because they they know everything you know, they they know a lot more than governments. They know the corpus has gotten in there. They can see how this tool is um, behaving according to prompts, but they're not releasing that information. So on the pure grounds of a lack of transparency reports, no, I don't trust some argument and I won't until I see some transparency reports and evidence that those policies are being implemented. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I'll take on that one. I think there's a lot of companies out there that I think we wish had a little bit more transparency in, in what they're doing. And for one final question, for people who are wanting to think a little bit more about the ethical uses of AI and how to integrate it, do you have any advice for people that maybe they can start using even next week of like how you get started kind of being more informed or getting started in this area? Yeah. I mean, just experimentation. I think that's at the very core of like of design philosophy from my perspective anyway, is just fool around with it, you know, experiment, practice using inputs for your writing, try it for writing emails, try putting in, you know, qualitative data on a very kind of 
simple level, what do I use it? I think I use it like 20, 30 times a day. I must do 30 inputs a day. Okay. And a lot of those will be like, I'll just ask a question. Like, um, what's so like context, you're a principal UX writer, leader in your field. What, what, what would be your suggestion of an alternative to this CTA copy? And then I'll give it like a, a sort of a reduced style guide. So that could be one. Or you could ask it, you know, what's a creative solution, you know, for like a, you know, if you've got a design question you're asking yourself, just ask ChatGPT and you can say, don't make any assumptions, ask me. So you can actually encourage it to ask you back and not make assumptions, which unfortunately it does without that prompt. But again, there's a fantastic article I referenced that I think that Jeff wrote on the Fountain Institute website, that's what you need to read. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, talking with us today and letting us know all your insights about this process and sharing your ideas. If you wanna get more involved with this wonderful community of designers, you can apply to the Guild of Working Designers. You can use this little QR code up top or go to bit.ly backslash Guild of Working Designers. This is the asynchronous community that we have where we can continue these conversations out of our monthly meetups. And just as a reminder, we are the Fountain to Our vision is a world that seeks designers for the way they think, not just what they produce. Thank you again, Pete. This is a real pleasure to have you on. And we'll see you in September. So thank you guys so much. Thank you.